What's up, guys? It's Q&A time on January 18th, 2019. Um, open, I think it was open Q&A this week. Posted this earlier in the week, and things got kind of crazy. So just now I'm getting to it, but I will, I'll go ahead and get right into the questions. All right, so first one, um, <clears throat> should someone become more insulin sensitive before taking something like Clen or another fat loss drug? Or... Can you work on sensitivity while taking the Clen or other fat loss um, supplements? So, <clears throat> well, fat loss in and of itself is going to help with insulin sensitivity in most cases. And there are other, some other indirect things that can impact the insulin sensitivity like sleep and stress and all that. But in general, if someone lowers their calories and, and loses body fat, they're going to become more insulin sensitive um, normally nutrient partitioning will improve and all that. So the two really go hand in hand. Um, the fat loss agents really don't have a lot to do with, aren't really correlated directly, so they're really not gonna interact with one another, I guess you could say. Um, not to any significant degree, so the answer would be, you don't necessarily have to be insulin sensitive, no. Um, Though being insulin sensitive is probably going to yield a better result in your fat loss efforts. So, um, diet training and overall recommended strategy for recomp coming off a layoff. Also, when to end said recomp, and also, can you cut and build as a guy coming off a long layoff? Oh man, I couldn't even begin to answer that question, to be honest. There's so much context that would have to be there. Um, somebody might be able to recomp after a layoff like that, depending on how much muscle they had previously and, you know, how, if they've, like, if they've lost some, a significant amount of muscle or put on a significant amount of fat, they may be able to recomp. Um, I can't, I couldn't, I couldn't even begin to give you some kind of answer. Like, do you need, uh, you'd have to really dig into that with like a full consultation. So feel free to contact me, <laughs> you know, I can definitely help, but um, can't really answer that on here. All right, next question. Uh, next person actually asked a couple questions and I'm only gonna answer one just because I do have several other questions, but um, feel free to resubmit your second one next time. It is a good question, it's just pretty long. And uh, if I answer both, it's gonna take forever, so. We'll just do the, the number one on here. Uh, does Synthol still have a place in the higher tiers of bodybuilding? Do you consider it to still be in use or has hyaluronic acid replaced it? <clears throat> I definitely don't think HA-based site enhancements have fully replaced it, though a lot of people have definitely switched to using them just because of the ease of use and safety and things like that. Now, there are, you know, an oil base is gonna have some different properties that you're never gonna be able to get from a water base. Uh, you know, you can have quicker, definitely gonna have a quicker result from an oil base, so it's not gonna be permanent, it's not gonna end, it's just a super tedious process. A lot of people don't wanna go through, it might be painful, you know, all that stuff. So, it's and it's very difficult to do right. Everyone's seen the botched jobs of it. Even people that are higher tier professionals that just don't quite do it correctly and it's definitely noticeable type of thing. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if it will ever be completely gone, but it's definitely gonna be a lot less people using it for obvious reasons. Um, so that's probably the best way I can answer that. But yeah, the oil base does have some different, I guess, different advantages. It just has a lot of, a lot more disadvantages as well. Okay, uh, next one. Let's move over to Instagram. Wait, let me double check here. Make sure we don't have any more. Yeah, so we'll move over to Instagram. All right. <clears throat> How to stay optimally hydrated when food volume is very high? That's a good. That's a good question. Okay, so definitely when someone's really, really pushing food and it's 
you don't want to drink much water, especially with the meals, just to bog down digestion. You're already struggling to get the food in. Uh, normally, in this case, it's easy, you know, electrolytes and stuff. We can always add that to the food. That's really not difficult. Um, you, in a case like this, I find, at least me personally, that I need to set myself some water cues. It might be something cheesy like having a bottle or a jug or something where you have to make marks on it, like in between, you know, if you're eating five meals in a day and you have a certain amount of water you wanna get, well, you have a certain amount you wanna drink in between each meal or something. Um, you might need to add some flavoring to some stuff, you know, like some uh, zero calorie diet drinks, stuff like that to get more fluid in. That's definitely, you, you would think you would need those less because you aren't hungry, but at the same time, like you get so not hungry that you don't even want to drink water and uh, they might come in handy. So, um, but yeah, I think, I think a lot of people just need cues. An easy one too is right off the bat in the morning, get some fluid in before you start eating. That's a great way to do it. It's going to help hydrate you quickly. Uh, and you know, it's going to get that, uh, whole process of hydration started and you, you know, obviously you haven't eaten yet, so it makes it easier. And another thing, uh, intra workout. So training days I always find are a lot easier just because especially when calories are very high and then if you're having a lot of intra workout carbohydrates and, and maybe hydrolyzed proteins and amino acids and things like that, it's very easy to get a ton of fluid in. Like, I mean, I know I drink shoot, uh, I was getting probably 150 carbs in intro workout and 50 grams of protein. I mean, I was drinking probably half a gallon of fluid. That's a lot. And that definitely hydrates you for a while. So that was most of, I mean, that was a good amount of my day's hydration right there. So intro workout's a good place to add that in as well. Okay, next one. <clears throat> I train during my lunch break while it's at work and want to incorporate an insulin GH protocol. My options are GH upon waking and insulin pre-workout or both GH and insulin pre-workout at the same time. Is there much difference? <clears throat> not really, not really a lot of difference. Ideally, you probably take your total GH dose and unless it's like really small, unless you're only doing like a half, I don't know, you know, like a half or one IU or something, if you could just split it, uh, you could just split it morning and pre-workout to get two smaller GH administrations. It's probably going to be a little bit better, again, depending on what the dose is. Um, and you could do, uh, and the insulin thing, I mean, that really is up to you. You don't have to do it pre-workout. That's one time people do it because they have the peri-workout nutrition. But, I mean, really... Insulin is just solely based on blood glucoses when you eat carbohydrates, things like that. So it doesn't necessarily have to be pre-workout. Uh, if that's if you only have the means to use it once a day, then sure, that could be a time that you would use it. Though it doesn't have to be. So um, yeah, so split if possible. Split morning and pre-workout GH and then the insulin pre-workout. And, but you could, like I said, you could certainly add it in other places. I mean, you're going to be producing endogenous insulin from your pancreas every time you eat carbohydrates. I mean, every time you eat protein, every time you eat a meal, you're going to be producing it. So it doesn't, it's not limited to that, that time. Though I know, I understand that a lot of people like to do it with that, that carb bolus intro workout, <clears throat> but it need a little, I need to know a little more in terms of like how much total you know gh is being used and for like the you know the day total budgeted and whatnot uh, thoughts on replacing testosterone and using deca for hormone replacement therapy could deca replace test in this method well if you really dig there is some literature on nandrolone as a hormone replacement though if you look around i've yet to see anyone be prescribed strictly nandrolone for hormone replacement now now when i say that 
there are the like the anti-aging type clinics and stuff that will prescribe it on top of the testosterone but i just not even more progressive doctors like i don't think i've ever heard of anyone being prescribed nandrolone only as a hormone replacement therapy option so <clears throat> i have could it work? I mean, it could definitely work. I mean, you, you're replacing your androgens. So, I mean, it can work, you know. And some people might feel okay on it. There are other concerns that could arise, though. Like, uh, like for example, how it affects QT intervals. Like, I don't know that that's something I would want to be messing with long-term, all the time, constantly. Um, so, what would, you know, what are the cardiac effects for that versus versus testosterone and so on. So maybe something that will happen in as things progress more, but I don't think there's enough solid information to uh, go that route yet. Next one, uh, thoughts on blasting DECA only. Yeah, there's plenty of people that do it. Uh, it aromatizes less than testosterone, but enough to give you a you know sufficient estrogen. People can run a lot higher on its own with no side effects. There's lots of people that do it. Lots of people that swear by it. It does not work. It doesn't necessarily work for everybody. Um, and to add to that, I mean, there's people that'll that'll use a high amount and then they add a testosterone to that, and that's when side effects start happening. And you know, so by itself is a better option for some people. Uh, it's something that you just have to try, like, you know. Um, but yeah, there's plenty of people that do it successfully and maintain a good ratio of hormones and have very little side effects. Uh, so yeah, it can work. One more question, it appears. Currently, I use dextrose and a regular whey protein peri-workout without issues. So I'm assuming like digestion and stuff is pretty good. Uh, our HBCD, so highly branched cyclic dextrin carbs and hydrolyzed whey recommended to get the most out of an insulin and GH. Or is the benefit negligible? It's negligible. Yeah, it is. I mean... You're driving glucose, it's all going to come down to you driving glucose into the cell. Uh, doesn't really matter, honestly. It's not going to make any significant difference. A lot of the time, these high molecular weight carbohydrates are just digesting better and quicker. Now, that can be that can definitely be beneficial. But if you are able to use dextrose and don't have any issues, then I don't see anything extremely wrong with it. Downside might be that it that it does take longer to pass through the gut. It might pull a little bit of blood into the gut and kind of pull some of the blood out of the mu that you want in the muscles. Um, actually, talked about this on a thread the other day. Digestion being such a parasympathetic process and uh, training being such a sympathetic process that the two don't really go well. So you don't want anything that's going to sit in your gut and take. A lot of energy and resources from your body to digest while you're training but again I mean if those things feel good and you're still able to get good pumps and you don't feel bloated and all that then you're probably digesting them just fine um, so it's probably a non-issue okay all right guys that is it for this week I'll get the new thread posted pretty soon, and I'll talk to you guys next week.